Hello, my sisters and brothers. I want to thank God for you. And I thank you for tuning in and connecting with us by way of the digital media. I know these are some very difficult and challenging times, but I wanted to come on to offer you a word of hope, a word of encouragement. I wanted to say to you to be strong and be encouraged and know that our God is on our side. We are undefeated because we are more than conquerors. I love you. God bless you. And may he keep you. Hello, we are the Hectors. We've been at the Family of Faith for four years, and we are excited to go serving care. Hey, good evening. Welcome. Thanks again for joining us on another edition of our Wednesday night kind of Sunday school thing that we've got going on. Um, it's a wonderful privilege. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to come together virtually. And we're glad you decided to sit down to gather around your tablet, your phone, your laptop, your smart TV, uh, whatever you're watching this on to view us. We want to say thanks, first of all, for those who have been joining us on the weekends via Zoom. Our children, as you know by now, meet each Saturday at 5.30 p.m. Our teens meet each Saturday at 6 30 p.m. Uh, our adults are meeting Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. and then our seniors are meeting each Wednesday at noon via conference call. We're continuing to come together. We're continuing to learn together. We are continuing as discipleship in this season goes digital. This week we are continuing our study through the books of the prophets and this week we're looking at the prophet Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah's book, he, he actually writes in an interesting time. As you know, many of the prophets deal around what is what I consider the historical centerpiece of the Old Testament, the exile. That is that time where the children of Israel were taken captive from their homeland and sort of spread about. Uh, Zechariah is interesting because his book, he was actually born during the exile. So while the other prophets were prophesying and speaking to the nation, telling them about the exile that was forthcoming and what life would be like afterward from the standpoint of where they lived in the nation, he was actually born apart or separated physically, geographically from the land of Israel. And so his book of prophecy comes and sort of tells the people what life will be like for them once they return, what life will be like once they get back. So while his book is in that cluster that if you had a paper Bible, you would kind of flip over to get to the New Testament because all of those pages kind of stick and run together. His is actually fairly long. So we pick up this week from the eighth chapter of the book of Zechariah, where Zechariah really gets into what it's going to be like for the returning exiles once they get back home. And so we begin with verse one. Verses 1 through 8 say, The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city. And the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem each of them with cane in hand because of their age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. This is what the Lord Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at this time, but will it seem marvelous to me, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries that of the east and the west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. And so we see, as usual, a number of things that we can glean and we can kind of pick up. Again, it's always fascinating that even though no one really knew uh, what was going to be happening in our city, in our nation, in, in our world, when we would get to these things. But here we are studying them and they seem to correlate to where we find ourselves in our context currently. Um, but one of the first things that we learn from this portion, this this passage in Zechariah is that God, first of all, calls us to re-examine what's possible. 
Um, again, think about this. Zechariah is born in a time during the 70 year period where the nation of Israel uh, didn't know contextually, aside from the stories that they heard, what the nation of Israel looked like. They had no no point of reference for Jerusalem. They didn't know what life in Jerusalem seemed like. All they really knew was Babylonian captivity. And here is Zechariah telling them, first of all, that the place that you know, the life that you know, the context that you find yourself in, uh, as strange as it is or as normal as it might be to you, uh, this is not a permanent normal. This is not a place where you will be forever. This is not a place where this is not how life is always going to be for you. Uh, this is just a piece of it. And not only that, but life on the other side of Babylonian captivity, life on the other side of this period, this season of exile is going to be drastically different. It's going to look, it's going to feel, it's going to be very different from you. We see that when he mentions in verse four uh, to give them sort of a picture of what life for them was going to look like, because it's easy if you've been living in a place and in a context where everything that can go wrong kind of has gone wrong, that you sort of pick up the instinct to always be looking over your shoulder, to always look around for the for the last shoe to drop. Uh, there is a famous uh, experiment by a man named Pavlov, and what he would do is every time he would ring a bell, he would give a dog something to eat. And so he would ring the bell, give the dog something to eat, ring the bell, give the dog something to eat. And as a result, eventually the dog started salivating every time the dog heard the bell because the dog just expected that every time the bell would ring, that there would be something to eat coming. Uh, something similar can happen to us when we find ourselves always kind of living in these situations where things like seem to always be going bad and we find ourselves living it through these things and through these times where everything that can go wrong sort of will go wrong and where you don't know what to expect or what the next day is going to bring. And there's always this state of inconsistency. There's always this state of flux. And we can just wake up each day and just expect that because that was the normal yesterday, that that's going to be the normal today. But God says through Zechariah that that's not going to be the case, that there is a life that is on the other side of this. And the life that, you, that is on the other side of this, he said, it's going to be so stable for you. It's going to be so different from what your experience is now. And to help illustrate this, uh, he uses, he paints the picture and he says that there will be old men, old people in the city who will have to use canes to walk. In other words, they will be living in the city so long that they will have old age. They will live there long enough to get old. They will live there long enough to see their lives uh, expand from one stage to the next, all in the city of Jerusalem where they won't have to worry about the exile. They won't have to worry about being subject to the rule of any and every global superpower. And not only that, but the prophet Zechariah also says that the children will be playing in the streets. In other words, they won't be so caught up with the cares and the worries of the context that's happening around them, they will be so carefree that all they'll want to do is be a child. They'll be free to just exist in the way that children naturally and normally do. So the children will be playing in the streets. The old men, the old women will be old and, and comfortable and have a life that is settled, that is stable, different from where they are now. And he raises an interesting question. He says, in, us, in essence, I know that saying these things sounds ridiculous to you. I know that saying these things sounds incredible to you and it's hard to conceive a life that is filled with happiness. It's hard to conceive a life that is filled with a stress-free existence. It's hard to conceive a life that doesn't have the levels of anxiety that this current state brings you. He said, but even though it might be too hard for you, it's not too hard for me. Uh, because you serve and you follow a God who is able to do, in the words of Paul, exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And so the prophet Zechariah first begins by reminding them and by telling them and by challenging them, just like he challenges us, to rethink what normal is. To, to, to understand that as bad as the new normal has become, to cause us to, to look at and to believe that there is a brighter side, a brighter day uh, ahead of us. The, there's an old song that says there's a bright side somewhere and don't stop until you find it. So Zechariah picks this up in verse 14 when he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Just as I had determined to bring disaster on you and showed you no pity when your ancestors angered me, 
says the Lord. So now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and to Judah. Do not be afraid. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other. Render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all of this, declares the Lord. So the other thing that we notice is that God calls us to change when our circumstances do. The prophet Zechariah tells them that they will return to Jerusalem. He tells them that this place where they find themselves is not their permanent normal, that even though it's a new normal, it's not an everlasting one, it's not an eternal one. But when you get back to Jerusalem, when you get back to your homeland, when you get back to Judah, there are some things that you have to shift. That there are some things that you were doing previously that actually ended you up in this position uh, that you won't have to, that you won't be able to do anymore. A few weeks ago, uh, Dr. Jones convened an online uh, sort of summit and conference, and one of the presenters there, as he was discussing with us what it's like to minister and to function as a church and as leaders uh, in this time of corona and COVID-19 and quarantine and things like that, and social distancing, he said to us something that I believe will stick with me for a very long time. He said that, you know, everyone is anxious to return to normal, but we have to consider what parts of normal are worth returning to. And while that's true for where we are in terms of social distancing, in terms of quarantine and in terms of this pandemic, that's also true for our lives, right? That when we come out of the experiences that traumatize us, when we come out of the situations that seem to do a lot to us and within us, uh, it causes us to kind of shift and to re-examine what are the things that we have to keep doing. Here's an example. So, you know, if I were to, God forbid, have to go to the hospital for having uh, high blood pressure, the one thing I would have to re-examine would be my love for fried chicken or my love for fried pork chops or my love for food that would cause me to get back in the, into the condition that caused me to get in trouble in the first place. In other words, when God brings us out of places, when God calls us out and brings us through difficult and stressful and straining situations that cause us to sort of re-examine where we've been and where we are, it's ours, the proper and the responsible thing to do is to re-examine our course, to re-examine our actions, to re-examine the things that might have put us on the path that helped us to end up where we were so that we can never do them again. And so he calls on the nation of Israel to change. And this is how he calls them to change. He tells them, first of all, these are the things that you are to do. Speak the truth to each other, to render true and sound. Oh, OK, I'm looking down. I should look back up, but I'm reading. Uh, he says, these are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other. Render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all of this, declares the Lord. In other words, God calls them to change their course of action. Uh, again, prior to the exile, prior to Babylonian captivity, the nation of Judah had become very corrupt. Uh, it had become very imbalanced in its treatment, especially for the poor and the marginalized. It had become very unfair and life for the poorest of those in Judah and Jerusalem was not like life for those who had means. Uh, systems had become corrupt both politically and religiously. And Zechariah essentially tells the nation and he tells us, that God doesn't bring us out of things for us to just act the way that we've always been acting. God doesn't deliver us from circumstances so that we can continue our bad courses of action that got us in those positions in the first place. One of the ways to ensure that life will be better is to act better. And so God calls us to re-examine and he calls the nation to examine how they've been acting both on an individual and on a collective level. He tells them to speak the truth to one another. Uh, while there were people who were in power, that's something that all of us can do. Uh, speak the truth to one another. And then he calls on a larger, more institutional, more collective level to render true judgments in the courts. 
uh, to come back to a national place of justice, to come back to an institutional place of equity and balance and fairness. Uh, in other words, this is something that does not just happen between in, in our interpersonal relationships. It also happens on a larger institutional scale that spreads out. Uh, and so God calls us after we've been delivered, after we have come out of the things that shake us up and that readjust our lives. God calls us to reexamine how we are and how we've been behaving so that we can uh, live life in such a way that these things don't happen again. You know, in the New Testament, there are two instances, two interactions that Jesus has with two distinct people. Uh, one happens when Jesus is just kind of chilling one day, minding his own business, and the Pharisees bring a woman to him that is caught in the act of adultery, which has always been interesting to me because adultery is one of those things that requires two people, and yet they only brought one to him. And so Jesus uh, says, Jesus, uh, the Pharisees rather challenge Jesus, and they say, hey, Jesus, what do you think we should do with this woman? Because the Mosaic law says that she is to be stoned and put to death. So anytime you're ready, Jesus, we got these rocks. We're ready to kill her. And Jesus, rather than agree with him and rather than jump on them for this woman who was living through this very traumatic uh, life altering experience, life threatening experience, because here she is surrounded by people who literally want to kill her. Jesus, the Bible says, stoops down and starts writing in the sand. We don't know what he wrote. Uh, and he says, the person who is without sin, let them throw the first stone. He looks up and then out of nowhere, all of the people that wanted her dead, all of the people that wanted to kill her were nowhere to be found. We also find Jesus uh, in the fifth chapter of John walking through a pool known as Bethesda that has five porches. And the rule there or the legend had it that every, around a certain part of the year, there was always an angel that would come down and stir up or trouble the water. And the first person to step in every year would be the first person that was healed. Jesus encounters a man who had been there for 38 years in that same spot, in that same position for 38 years. Uh, he asks him, do you want to be made well? The man responds and says, whenever I try to get to the water, there's no one, or whenever I try to move, I don't have anyone who can help me get to where I need to be. Jesus tells him to take up his bed and his walk, uh, take up his bed rather and walk. What's interesting is that for both of these people, the man who was paralyzed and who had been at the pool for 38 years and the woman who had been caught in adultery, Jesus shares one phrase with them uh, that I think ties into what the prophet Zechariah is telling the people in this text and is also telling us as we prepare to in some way in some time in the future, get ready to reacclimate ourselves to what life will be like on the other side of this. He tells them, go and sin no more. In other words, Yes, you've been healed. Yes, you've been delivered. You've been rescued from this situation that you are in. But the response is not to go back to the same course of actions. The response is to examine what got you here and then alter your course of behavior so that nothing else befalls you. Once again, we thank you for joining us. We pray that this has been uh, uh, an enjoyable time for you, a time that's been one of enriching and, and blessings for you. Would you like this video? Would you share it? Would you leave a comment? Let us know how you've been blessed by these sessions. Uh, we want to also remind you that our children will be meeting this Saturday evening at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom, and our teens will meet right after them at 6.30 on Saturdays via Zoom. Sister Arnetta and Brother Marcus are doing a wonderful and phenomenal job guiding and engaging them. Our adults growing in Christ is meeting Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. And, and Deacon Darwin Jones has been a phenomenal blessing and each time, each session, each class has been a great period that we've all shared together in growth and grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We also want to send a quick shout out to all of the mothers who are watching, wishing you a happy Mother's Day and to my mother who I'm sure has left 78 comments by now. Happy Mother's Day to you as well. Uh, we pray that this Sunday will be one that you will enjoy. That will be a great and tremendous blessing to you even as we celebrate through socially distanced times. Uh, thanks so much and we will see you next week. God bless.
Hello, thank you so much for tuning in and for sharing with us by way of the digital media. And we're so happy for partners like you and for members who are so faithful to our ministry. I want to invite you to sow a seed. The giving options are there on your screen. And again, God bless you. May the Lord God keep you. And thank you for sowing into what we believe to be good ground as we seek to serve God by serving his people. I want to invite you to be a part of our digital prayer ministry every Saturday night at 9 p.m. The information is on your screen as to how you can get connected to us. In fact, we'll actually go live while we're doing our prayer time. And I believe that in times like these, we need to be praying. In fact, I want to pray for you and your family now. God, how grateful we are for life, health and strength. Even as we're struggling with this pandemic, we are thankful for more than 100,000 lives, God, that have already been recovered, God. And I just thank you now in advance for what you're going to do as we are praying for a medical breakthrough. We lift those who have been affected by this virus, God, that you would be their strength, be their joy, be their hope. And God, you're Jehovah Rapha. So we are honoring you and worshiping you and beseeching you now as God our healer. God, we pray for our president, our governor, all of the powers that be. We pray for the health care professionals, God, that you would give them the wisdom to adequately care for all who are affected. And God, we do believe that this too shall pass. In the name of Jesus, we love you, we bless you, and praise you now. Amen.